fear. I'd rather die of like a heart attack or a stroke or getting shot or something. I'd rather have that than get dementia or Alzheimer's because the fact of the matter is that I won't know what's going on, but the fact that, you know, my significant other and my family are going to know what's going on and they're kind of suffering there just as much with me. So in order to prevent this, we need to be Ooh, reading I gotta books. Go. Hey. I've been working, so them please don't hit my phone. Yeah. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Hey. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Hey. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. Hey. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. I swear I paid on my fees. Yeah. I was starving for this game. Now my fan, they can't eat. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Couple Nurses Podcast here on A Couple News with your hosts, Matt and myself, Peter. Thank you for tuning in. If you guys don't know, make sure to check us on YouTube. We have all our videos on YouTube and officially now on Spotify as well. So if you're listening, you might want to flip that screen and pop the video on. Matt's wearing an awesome t-shirt spelled out love in um, medical things. He's got a syringe, stethoscope, um, and some band-aids over there. I have the coffee scrubs rubber gloves which is going to be available soon on a couple nurses shop and for those, for those of you that don't know we have a website we're sparking it up pushing sprucing it up a little bit matt's having all hands on deck right there for y'all you guys can check out all our old episodes all our blog posts that's couple nurses.com and of course the shop is couple nurses.shop if you guys like us on youtube make sure you leave a comment make sure you like if you guys have any episode ideas shoot us a dm mention us in a face in a facebook group or hit us up on a facebook page uh, we're on basically all social platforms now, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and also, don't forget to check out FrontlineWarriorsClub.com. That's our sister site, and that's kind of where we house our more mindfulness, wellness, conscious opening of your body kind of stuff. You could say blog posts over there, and we have some new stuff coming out shortly, pretty soon here uh, regarding that website. We're still trying to grow that site, and we're just bouncing off ideas, but it's a really cool place to learn more about yourself, more about nutrition, just more about anything kind of health related. And of course, Pronto, spelled P-R-L-T-O, dot com is going to be launched here shortly. Landing pages should be already out, so if you could go on that, check us out. Uh, you could subscribe there, add your email address, add your zip code, first name, last name, because that's something that we've been working on for the past, I want to say six to eight months now, and it's going to revolutionize and innovate how we do healthcare employment and just how healthcare workers find jobs, pursue their passions, goals, and education. And it's really neat because we're trying to kind of unite everything in healthcare. A lot of moving pieces going on over there. We're just trying to bring it all into one because it could get very complicated and very confusing once you leave nursing school. What's up, Matt? Hello, beautiful people. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the three reasons why you should be reading books. And towards the end of the episode, we're going to talk about one of our favorite books that we each read for the past year. And it's going to be a little bit about life, philosophy. So definitely put on your critical thinking caps. We're going to go we're going to take a deep dive as always in these episodes, but this month is February and it's actually National Library Lovers Month. So if you own a book, if you love reading books, housing them, organizing them, categorizing, studying, anything book related, this is the month of February 4th. So we're going to talk about our favorite books. You're uh, looking back when we were skipping this episode, like in, in school, in high school, I never really liked reading books. There's actually one book that I liked reading in high school. It was like The Last Kingdom and it was a book about... The Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings, how there's a, I think there's a movie on it now. It's called The Kingdom as well. It's on Netflix. But it's basically an Anglo-Saxon kid that gets, his father gets killed and he gets given to like the Vikings and he's raised as a, as a Viking. And then he kind of switches sides here and there. That's probably the, my favorite book that I've probably read all through, I guess, high school and grade school. Because I never liked reading. Because every time somebody made you read something, it was nothing that you wanted to read. And... I was the one. I was one of those kids that if you told me to do something, I really didn't want to do it. So I tried to avoid as much as possible, and then I didn't really start to get into reading on my own, you could say, or actually like enjoying it. Probably until I don't know, maybe like the last semester of nursing school, because in nursing school you read a lot of textbooks. So if I'm reading a lot of textbooks, I really don't get any enjoyment from reading rec- like other books. I'm just reading. I rather do something else because I'm stuck in class reading the board, reading the PowerPoints, and I got to go come home, read textbooks. I wasn't really a fan of reading like books for fun. And then, yeah, like I said, last semester of, of college, I kind of started taking upon myself to read. And then coming out of college, I really started to read books that I liked because I realized that, hey, there's books about all sorts of things. And I was really big into like history, science, philosophy, um, like theory-based things in psychology. So I decided to read like these kind of books and 
ever since then I kind of you could say fell in love with anything um nonfiction, right? Nonfiction means real, right? Nonfiction means real. Yeah, yeah. I always get I still get that confused to the day because I always remember it by fiction equals fake. So nonfiction me- means non-fake, but it's like I remind myself sometimes. Yeah, and those are the books I enjoy reading as well. Nonfiction. And definitely like being younger and being foreign, being forced to learn a different language and reading books that you didn't want to, to begin with, it was really hard to cultivate that love to read. Mm-hmm. I despised reading. I, I remember faking the book reports. I, I remember faking a Lord of the Rings. I, I told the teacher I read the book and I really just watched the movie and did the book report. And she asked me a question and she knew that in the book, and in the movie, that doesn't happen. So I got, got caught. It. I got caught, man. Because you just sparks note, sparks note that that thing, right? I think I lost my ability to get the Six Flags pass. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, no, I got my Six Flags. Like, dude, I remember getting a Six Flags pass in grade school when we used to go to school together. And I remember your mom was was a chaperone there. Oh, in fifth grade. Yeah, yeah. And I remember going on, on a roller coaster ride with her. She was super scared, and I was kind of scared too. But I don't know. I don't know how you ended Did you up. Hold my mom's hand or what? <laughs> Maybe. Pro- I have no idea. Maybe she held my hand. You know, I don't know. But like we were both scared, and somehow we we just dared together. And that's probably the first time I ever met your mom. It's funny because I bought a baby blue hat that for that like event. Mm-hmm. That was really cool. And this baby blue hat lasted about a good hour because we went on the water slide with the log. <laughs> Shit flew right out. <laughs> yeah, man. Oh, good times. Good times. Yeah, book reports. But I used to spark notes the crap out of those. And our my English professor in high school wasn't really tech savvy for the first, I want to say, two years. And then the third year of high school and the fourth, we had this younger guy. And he would potentially go on – he would – not potentially, but he would purposely go on Spark Notes so he would know what to not put on the exam. So he would, he would kind of weasel his way into figuring out who actually read the book and who didn't. And he, he was a perfect so well. teacher for people like you. Yeah, perfect. Because he got my ass every time. Yep. And what's even worse, like, can you imagine yourself reading a book in Polish? I've done it before, but it's tough now because I've, I am not keeping up with Polish books. I remember one time when I was growing up, maybe this was like seventh grade or something like that. One of my aunts brought me a Polish version of Harry Potter. And I was like so excited to read it. I'm like, yeah, I'm going I'm to I'm read this book, you know, because you're a kid and you, you didn't really know how much focus and energy reading a book takes. And I was like, yeah, I got through the first page. It took me like four days, bro. And like, it, was, it was bad. I had, I had to have, have my mom help me out with some of these words. And you're still reading Harry Potter to this day. Dude, that book is sitting on a shelf ever <laughs> since. Still in my parents' house, still in the same place I left it, bro. The <laughs> Polish. I saw the first Polish book that I genuinely wanted to read and the last one. I couldn't do it. So speaking of reading, let's talk a little bit about the history of reading and where this all started. So it actually started about 4,000 to 6,000 BCE in Mesopotamia, which according to history is the first known civilization. And they cultivated human civilization there. And we discovered like a cuneiform, which was the oldest form of writing and scripting basically. And what they used there is they kept track with like squiggly lines, which represented goats and uh, oxes, which was like an ability to list goods. Mm. So they used writing at first to trade and eventually to storytell. If you look at those caves in Africa, remember when there's like uh, the bulls and all that, yeah. whatever was there. I remember on History Channel back then. I'm not going to make this up right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe you, man. I've seen the same bulls, bro. I'm <laughs> telling you, man. Somebody, two oxen equals one bull. Yeah, back in the day, they used to trade like that, bro. Barter. Yeah, and, and that's how writing started. And if we kind of fast pace to our current society, people use writing to transport themselves to a different world. We personally like nonfiction and self-improvement. Uh, there's people that read books to escape reality in a sense. They get to know different characters, different stories. They learn about different emotions that these characters have um, that they otherwise wouldn't be feeling if they wouldn't be reading the book. So it really takes you on a journey. And there's more to reading than just enjoying it. There's actually real benefits that we're going to talk about on the show as, as well as physical and both mental health. Mm. So the first one is that reading reduces stress. And it makes sense if you open up a book and simply read. It kind of takes you away from the current state of reality and you kind of forget about what's happening or maybe a sh- city situation if you could read after having like an emotional outburst. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you're artistic and you feel overwhelmed and you need to get your creative juices back. You could also do that and have like a de-stressor. On a physical level, there was a study in 2009 that showed that lowering or reading a book was able to relax your body 
your heart rate and actually ease tension in the muscles. Mm. Uh, so this was a study from the University of USEX that uh, testing these uh, students they found that reading books reduced stress by up to 68%, mm -hmm. which was a lot more effective than going for a walk, which was only 42% effective, drinking a cup of tea, which was 54% effective, and listening to music, which was 61% effective at reducing stress. And it makes complete sense because when you think of stress, like when you go for a walk, when you're walking, you can still be thinking about what stressed you out today, you're thinking about tomorrow, what you have to do, what you haven't done, the assignments do, this one's late. You're always thinking about stuff. And what's nice about reading is that it takes your mind off of things. It gr grinds you in a way, it grounds you in a way because most stress nowadays is, is mental stress. That's where all the stress is basically coming from because we don't have somebody chasing us all the time. You don't have these giant animals like mammoths, saber tooth tigers or monkeys, gorillas or any kind of lions chasing us. We don't have to worry about that anymore. No zebras. No zebras, nothing like that. Well, zebras are stressed about us, man. <laughs> predators out here. <laughs> but that you're stressed out mentally and emotionally. You're not stressed out physically. It's the, these mental and physical or these mental and emotional stresses that cause you physical stress you could say but it all starts in your brain so if you get your mind off of these things well then guess what it's going to naturally decrease the amount of stress in your body yes. which 100 percent makes that's why it's more beneficial than a walk because when you're walking or you're doing something physical you're not really always not thinking about things except maybe when you're doing something really strenuous or hard like trying to lift heavy weight where you got to really focus in on, on that weight because you want to get a good lift in or you're kind of you're trying to be safe if you're just going for a walk or maybe just drinking some tea, your mind's still still rolling. And you're not going to get past that stress if you don't take that mind off of it. Escape into a book. That's what I'm saying. Another study in 2009 compared uh, the effects of yoga, humor, and reading a book. So they took uh, students from a health science program in the United States, and they the study found that reading for 30 minutes lowered blood pressure, heart rate, and feelings of psychological distress just as effective as yoga and humor did. Mm-hmm. So all you really need to do is just schedule 30 minutes in your day and it's going to have the same effects as going to uh, a yoga studio for one hour, according to research when it comes to stress. I wonder if the type of book you are reading has anything to do with these effects. Because you know how a lot of females like those crime ones where somebody gets kidnapped and things like that? Because a lot of girls watch 50 those crime Shades stuff. of Grey. Yeah, I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey is, is different. It's more of like a... Stimulates you. Yeah, like a, se like a sexual kind of bondage thing versus like... The stuff that's, I don't, know, I don't know what that show is on Netflix where that guy kidnaps people and then he kills them and stuff like that. Dexter? No, that one's pretty cool. But there's like one show that the girl used to watch that, that I know. It was just like this guy that was like a psychopath. He would follow girls or something and then he would kidnap them. And then he would hold them hostage for a little bit and then he would let them go. It was, it was weird. So that's what they like you're but, saying. Yeah, because a lot of women... speculating are, here. We're not being sexist, by no, the no, way. No, this no, is, this is a fact. <laughs> this is a fact. Women women prefer crime novels. That's why women always watch the, the crime stuff on Netflix. That's like the target audience is is females. And I don't know why why it's like that. Because if you put a girl in a situation, no girl wants to be in a situation. But somehow they would want to they want to watch about it, which is strange. We have 70% audience females. So we should probably talk about a book that has to do with crime. Probably yeah. boost up the downloads here. Maybe, maybe. Or you know, or y'all could tell us why do you like these things so much? Because it always blew my mind. Like I'm not, I don't like it. Like I'm like, I don't want to watch a thing about a psychopath stalking woman and then kidnapping them. Or like those TV shows that are based on on true events. How this this murder raped like 12 women and killed like or 16. Like shit, like I don't want to watch something about a female that killed 16 dudes and like chopped their heads off or something, right? Like, but it's, but for some reason, y'all females like that kind of stuff for whatever reason. It's like, I don't know if it's programmed in or what, but it's, it's always strange. I'm let, not a fan of it. Let us know, hit us up in the DMs. Yeah, you can let Matt know, Matt will pass on information to me. Or you can just <laughs> drop a comment on YouTube, you could drop a, you know, comment on a Facebook group or whatever, you know? Exactly. Like, or, or you don't know. But if you don't know, then that's why we're telling you. <laughs> Peter's saying that because I keep catching him saying that word, you know, <laughs> reading know. strains your brain. So there was a study in 2013 that showed how reading a novel increased communication between different parts of the, the brain that controlled language processing. Uh, and these changes were segregated into different no, uh, networks that was associated with uh, short term changes that occurred in the left angular gyrus, which is in charge of language, reading and writing, and also the som somatosensory cortex which is all about receiving and sense uh, processing your seven or oh, seven senses five senses 
I'm thinking about tele- telepathy right here. You never know. Maybe you got seven, bro. Telekinesis. But that's that's so true too. If you think about society nowadays, everything is so fast paced. Everything is in sound bites. It's just looking at something for like minute, like reels or, or TikToks. Those are a minute in length, thirty seconds in length, because because these attention. people know right. It's, attention span is lower. Attention span is the the quicker you're cycling through information, and the easier it is for you to recognize it and, and watch it because it's it's quick. You don't got to put a lot of thought into a lot of focus. And why reading strengthens your brain is because it flips that switch from short attention span to long attention span because now you have to focus on this page for four minutes five minutes however long it takes you to to, to read that book and then you actually also have to actually think about it so now i'm already devoting time to reading this but also devoting time to thinking it thinking about this about just this one topic compared to having like 60 different tiktoks pop out, pop out at you for that five minutes in, in time yeah. which is why it strengthens your brain and like matt said with the whole neural pathways um there's that one saying if you don't or what some of the binds together, stays together, or something like that. Neurons that wire together, fire together. Yeah, that one, that one. And that's, that's like how it is. The the better, if you want to be better at having a longer attention span, you could say you're gonna to need to practice it because, like I said, society hardwires us to have these short attention spans where it's here, now, and go, and we're moving, and next clip, next video, next picture, next person, where we f- almost forget how to maintain focus for long periods of time. Even watching like a one hour podcast, like even for all you Joe Rogan fans out there or whatever podcast you have, people don't can't really sit down for one hour and listen, listen to a podcast or something long form. You can't because it's it's tough. Even even like for me, there's not a lot of times where I sit down and watch something for an hour. Usually it's maybe like it might be an hour in length, but maybe I watch 15 minutes and I get bored and I move on to the next thing. So it kind of shows you how we're almost programmed to just have these short attention spans and we prefer those sound bites because if you just hear the sound bites, it's almost like that soundbite is giving you just just enough information for you to make a decision. But when you actually have long-form content, you actually have to think about it and actually realize that, hey, maybe this is wrong, this is right, compared to a soundbite where it's just like super quick, you don't have time to think about it, so it has to be true almost. Even when you're meditating, you're sitting in your place of sanctuary, trying to concentrate, and all of a sudden your nose itches. And your nose is not itching, your brain is just bored so it's trying to create some kind of stimulation or I'm uncomfortable. Now I need to itch my leg. Oh, I need to move around. My back is a little bit. And your mind, it's like your mind is such ADHD that it's trying to just create some kind of uh, stimulation for you to act on. Uh, and the way that your that reading straightens the brain, so it actually works on neurogenesis. And this is the whole process of creating the new neural pathways. And um, the way this happens is neurogenesis basically creates and sends messages and transmits things to different parts of the brain. And this is what is creating these new networks that you said neurons that wire fired together. And the way this works is reading material that's, um, that requires thoughts, consideration. It takes sometimes efforts to metabolize if you're reading like a philosophy, philosophy book or something that's um, uh, nonfiction. Or maybe you're dissecting a fiction book and there's a lot going on and you're trying to understand a dialect. But it's leading to the creation of new neurons mm. and which has long lasting effects. So definitely reading a book is a good thing. And this goes directly to point number three, that reading uh, decreases the percentage of cognitive decline. Uh, so having a active life mentally is very important to prevent um, cognitive decline. You hear about it all the time. After 65, you want to keep on having a hobby or something because mm. you're going to have decline. It's a great way to protect yourself against Alzheimer's, dementia, and et cetera. 100%. And people think that just because they get older or because they're getting older, it, they associate that with, with a kind of, kind of decline. But actually, studies show that just because you're getting higher in age, that's not associated with, with kind of kind of decline. Your cognition should not decline just because of age. There's usually other factors that, that cause this. And what's crazy is that Matt found a study that was published in 2020. It was a 14-year longitudinal study with a sample size of about 1,900 Taiwanese uh, older people above the age of 64. And it actually showed that the more times you, you read a week, the better your cognition is. And that goes back to that whole focus thing because when Matt and I are nurses, majority of, of older patients, what they tell us for life advice is, A, don't get married too quick. And, and two, they always say to stay busy because 
your mind's like a muscle. If you don't work it out, it's going to decline over time. Like your like your biceps. If you don't do curls, if you don't do tricep extensions for your triceps, if you don't if you don't bench, if you don't squat, you can't grow his muscles. And for example, if you start going to a gym for six months and you work out hard in six months, you grow that muscle, and then you stop going for one year, two years, three years, it starts to decline and it starts to wither away. Same with your mind. If your mind is not focused on things, not not doing things, what's well, going to wither away because it's gonna your body's gonna think that it's not needed anymore. And that's when when people get into these these illnesses and these tough times is not because they're they're sick, it's because they kind of just almost like lost hope and couldn't really find joy in things that they like doing. So they just stopped doing them. And once they stop doing them, well then your mind just your mind just like, why am I gonna work? I'll just take the easy way out and I'll just just stagnate because it's gonna dwindle away. And it's very sad to see, but that's usually what people say is is always try and stay busy, always try to do new things and keep doing the things that, that you like because when people retire, you realize that your job requires you to commit about 40 hours a week plus or minus. And once that 40 hours a week plus or minus goes away, you can, you gotta find something to fill that void because our bodies are created to move, to think, to in, interact. And if you lose that 40 hours and you, you replace it with 40 hours of doing nothing or watching TV or not focusing on, on trying to get better or trying to do new things or keep doing the things that you wanted to do, well, you're just going to kind of rot away for a lack of a better expression. And it's sad to see. It's like nature. We're all part of it. We're mm. all part of this collective consciousness. You have to keep on evolving and doing things. Right, like, like a tree. Like We've seen trees. Trees out, outlive us. But if some, somebody stops watering that tree, trees start to dwindle. But the beauty of it that the beauty of it is that once you start watering it back up, it perks up again and it keeps growing and, and go back to normal. You just got to remember to water yourself, I guess, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I, I love this metaphor. I'm trying to think what water is. Water is... It's a solid gas and liquid, bro. It's intellectual activities. Yeah. Let's, put, let's, let's use that phrase sure, there. Sure. So you got to water yourself with intellectual activities. Kind of like direct activities, but intellectual activities. Yes. Uh, so this was a study in 2018 in China, which was... Uh, correlating and associating reading with the lower risk of dementia. Uh, this was a, a longitudinal study with 15,000 uh, community living Chinese individuals over the age of 65 who did not have dementia and they followed them for a median period of five years. Um, these people participated in daily activity, act, uh, participation, intellectual activities, and it showed a significantly lower risk of dementia several, several years later. Mm -hmm. And this is independent of their health behaviors, physical health limitations, and social demographic factors. Mm -hmm. So they really pinpointed that fact that, hey, staying busy mentally prevents you from getting dementia. And we all know how bad it looks in a hospital setting, man. It's honestly sad. Yeah, it's that phrase where, I mean, I keep forgetting these phrases, but somebody wants to tell me a phrase that's like, that like, you come in this, in, in this world as a child and you go back into this world as, a, as or you leave this world as a child. That's kind of how dementia is because as a child growing up, you don't really know how to poop, how to pee, how to interact. And people with dementia go through the same thing. So it's like they're, they're, they have a child's brain, but in a, an adult older body. And it's very unfortunate to see because they don't recall their loved ones. And the crazy thing is, is, is um, they don't know that they're going through it, the people with dementia and Alzheimer's, but their loved ones do. So it's like, if you think about it, it's not the biggest struggle for the person that is actually going through it. It's a really big struggle for a person that's not going through it. That's, that's like my biggest fear. I'd rather die of like a heart attack or a stroke or getting shot or something or get cancer. <laughs> you said shot. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's a quick death, man. You know what I'm sure. saying? Yeah, pop, pop, but whatever. It's is what it is. I'd rather have that than get dementia or Alzheimer's because the fact of the matter is that I won't know what, what's going on, but the fact that, you know, my significant other and my family are going to know what's going on and they're kind of suffering there just as much with me because with like cancer for example why i would have preferred to have cancer over dementia is because i'm going through it and i understand that i'm going through it so i have some kind of control but once you have alzheimer's dementia you really don't have any control of over anything over your emotions over your thoughts because because it's almost like if you think about it is, is the soul still there if you don't recollect or comprehend what's going on where is it and if you make peace with your cancer mm -hmm. your family's going to have peace with it that you're peaceful in your decision and right. it's like it's a warm death technically at mm -hmm. the end versus the suffering that this person sees. And imagine if this, that same person keeps repeating like, oh, you want to go here or you want to go there? And this happened like 10, 15 years ago. 
and you keep bringing up that old emotion and that person, your family member, and they just keep feeling so sad about it because you're not there, but you want to be there. It's heartbreaking, man. Yeah. Because imagine you have a significant other that you... I got chills, man. Yeah. Like imagine marrying somebody and loving that person for 50 years. And then one day you start declining and you get Alzheimer's and that person has to take care of you. But you don't like you don't know. You don't know. So, so yeah, it's super tough because they're grieving, but you don't understand that they're grieving. And you don't understand that that what's going through through your mind either or through your body which is like it's super heartbreaking because you, because you don't know it and you can't have any kind of impact on it like you said with cancer you can have a good grieving process you know you're, you're okay with that you're okay with this and you could let that person know you can still tell me you love them but if you have alzheimer's you, you, just, you don't you don't know you yep. might get hit with like some flashbacks where you're where those ptsd patients that have alzheimer's where they think they're in a war imagine that having to take care of some, somebody that you've been married to for 40 years and he's been through he or she has been with you for, the, for these 40 years and all of a sudden the only thing they remember is war war every day war war and it's like like shit like it's, it's tough. tough it's super tough so in order to prevent this we need to be reading books make have, it a habit did you like when growing up i never saw my parents reading books have you saw your parents read books uh they read a lot of the newspaper and my mom actually is into reading books mm. but it's the religious ones my grandma they always share books and stuff like that so mm. yeah yeah, growing up, the yeah, newspaper, they were, they, were, they were for sure uh, read. Um, Tegotnik Potalanski, I, I believe it was called. They always read that. They always went to the grocery store, picked up a Tegotnik Potalanski. They would read that. But books, not really. And then my mom started reading books maybe like five years ago, like the religious ones and about like different stories. But then I introduced her to YouTube. And uh, now she, now it's like a little bit YouTube. And I don't really see her reading as much. I mean, she doesn't do a lot of YouTube to begin with because she's so busy. She does, does like a lot of baking, a lot of the cooking stuff. But that's one thing I'm gonna pass on to my kids is once they're able to read, or, or I'm or once as like you can read with them where they actually comprehend. I'm gonna push that a lot to them because I feel like if you start that at an early age, I feel like they develop better. Definitely, and yeah. the easiest way to make reading a habit is to incorporate it into your daily schedule. Maybe you want to assign this task that you're gonna read. Uh, what I personally like doing sometimes, and I haven't really done it since we got to San Diego because it's been a cluster. But half an hour before bed, 15 minutes, make it a habit. Take a book with you if you're traveling somewhere. Uh, try to read books that you're interested in as far as topics. And at the end of the day, just remember that it's a skill that you have to cultivate as far as a habit. Be consistent with it, and then it'll eventually come. And the best way to do it is just plan that activity. Mm. If you put it in your planner or reminder that you're supposed to read, you're more likely not to pass up on that activity, just like we did that uh, podcast episode about the New Year's resolution and how to create habits versus... Telling yourself, I'm going to read a book, but if you're not putting it or penciling it anywhere, it's more than likely you might just miss it because you're going to say, oh, I'm busy, or you're going to scroll instead because you're going to be feeding the higher dopamine activity. Mm. It's almost like going to the gym because for me, when I first picked up a book, I, I did not want to, but I knew that it was going to be good for me and I should read it. It's almost, it's almost like going to the gym where the first week sucks, but once you start going, you develop a habit and you start getting a little bit better at it because I used to hate reading and... Then I started watching some videos about the benefits of it. And I'm like, you know, I should probably try reading. So I started reading, but I, I dreaded the fact of having to pick up a book and, and, and read. But then when I read a few pages, I'm like, damn, this is actually very interesting. And I, wanted to, and I wanted to keep reading more and more and more. So it just, it sucks picking that book up if you're not really fond of reading. But once you kind of find um, like a genre that, that you enjoy, that you like, you're going to stick with it because you, you learn a lot, especially because we don't like to, I feel like we don't like to waste time a lot. So books that are not fiction we like because it's always teaching us something compared to like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter where it has a little bit of like a like a theme in it that's about learning but it's more of like uh, it's fiction so it's not something that that we can relate to and plus it's we're not doing, our genre yeah and plus I think I think also has something to do with that we're Polish so it's like we prefer like not necessarily learning but have but having something that we could possibly relate to. Because it's a lot easier for us to relate to almost like I feel like a psychologist compared to like Harry Potter, right? From a perspective, a post perspective, I feel like. Don't quote Peter on that one. I mean, I feel like I, I could. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. I, I just feel like since, since we're Polish, something in us is like trying to learn so we don't repeat the mistakes of our forefathers and so on and so forth. So we, we don't get taken over by Russia again or whatever. So it's like in Germany, almost, I ain't trying to do all that. That's again. what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I want to hide in the forest. I don't. My grand, my uh, great grandpa had to do that, so yeah. I'll pass. F don't that. be sorry to me. Be sorry to your. Well, I was apologizing to the audience. Apologizing to the audience because you're looking at my there. eyes, Ben. Well, yeah, because I know I messed up. Some's want to want some validation, you know. <laughs>
Yeah, so uh, we actually chose two books that we really enjoyed uh, to discuss a little bit. I um, definitely wrote a lot about mine, so you guys could check out more on the show notes at couplenurses.com um, on, the, on the episode. So, But I'll start off with Jordan Peterson. That's probably one of the first books I ever read was 12 Rules for Life. Uh, before that book, I read uh, some books about Buddhism. Um, I read a few books about different religions, but I feel like uh, Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, an antidote to, to chaos, was probably the most uh, revolutionary book for me. Um, I think I read it coming out of nursing school, and I was big into self-help. I was big into um, Robin. What's that big guy? Big name? Tony Robin. Robbins. Tony Robbins. I used to be big into him. And I was, I was like, I passed into school, so I'm like, hey, what, what else can I do? I, want, I had a bunch of different interests, but I'm like, hmm, let me just start to like look at some help, self-help book books because... I remember um, one of my teachers, I think she was my PEDS teacher, uh, I forgot her name, but she was PEDS and OB, and she actually, I never knew there was books like this, like self-help books, up until that class, because like I said, I wasn't big into reading, and it was uh, like James Colmia, I believe it was uh, the author's name, and that was the first self-help book I've ever heard about, and I kind of liked it, because it showed you a, like an interesting perspective in, into life, it was about... Uh, a book about how being like an Eagle Scout gave you an advantage in, in, in the world or something. Or this guy was an Eagle Scout and he tried to relate being an Eagle Scout into the, the, the real world and how it benefits you and so on and so forth. And this guy, James Comey, uh, he ended up being this this big businessman and just helping a lot of people in life. But basically, Jordan Peterson's book, uh, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. Um, a quick summary of it is basically... Uh, he used a lot of psychology, a lot of uh, theories, a lot of mythology, different ethical principles uh, to basically highlight that we come into this life with suffering and it's basically our role to to go go deep into ourselves and not only help ourselves but harness the ability to help others. Because if you have the ability to help others and things around you, well then you're kind of um, in a really good grow, growth process because for you to help others, you kind of have to first understand yourself. Do you decrease the suffering when you d- dive deeper into yourself? Uh, no, you never. So there, you never decreasing suffering. You're just kind of managing suffering. So suffering is in- inevitable. Inevitable in life. Inevitable. And he like the main things he brings up is like to change is is basically suffering. To not change is also suffering because if you're not changing, but you do want to change, well, guess what? You're suffering your whole your whole life. But if you do want to change, if you if you want to get bigger in size, gain muscle, guess what? Going to the gym put an effort in it's technically suffering so that's like one of his main overarching overarching uh themes and another big one in there was that you shouldn't you shouldn't pursue happiness if you expect happiness in, in life that's not something that's not a goal that you should aim for happiness should be a byproduct of what you're doing because what are you considering then on those days that you aren't happy you're not always happy so are those not happy days your failures it, it doesn't really work like that. So you, happiness shouldn't be a goal anybody should strive for. It should just be a byproduct. Same way you have a byproduct of sad days. Same way you, you, have, you have pain. Some, same way you have, you have sympathy to, to people. You're, you're happy. You're sad. You have all those emotions. They're, they're all there. And you shouldn't aim to have certain emotions. It, it just should happen. But you should still try to grow and progress as a human. But also then realize that the sum of everything around you is bigger than, than yourself. Um, and a first point that he brought up uh the first principle or the first rule of life was stand up straight with your shoulders back and he basically pointed that to lobsters so he does a lot of uh hierarchy stuff which means that um in nature there's always a hierarchy there's it's never a uh, even playing field and he compared it to lobsters that when lobsters uh hunt for not hunt for a mate but when they look for a mate um a lot of times it, it, it leads to conflict but the conflict doesn't always lead to violence. And the reason it doesn't lead to violence is because some of us, we're all born differently. So for example, these, these lobsters, if you have more serotonin um, and you have more of these neuro, neurochemicals, you're going to have a better posturing, which means you're going to be bigger, you're going to have bigger claws. And a lot of times, just the fact that that you have more serotonin, this DNA in you, um, you're going to be bigger than the other lobsters and you're going to have more serotonin. So a female is going to send the serotonin off of you and you're going to posture up to another lobster and the lobster is going to back off without even having any kind of combat. Just because 
almost like they they sense that there's an alpha there and the beta usually goes off to the side that's kind of how hierarchies do it. same same with animal kingdom a bigger lion is most likely gonna gonna be the the king of the pride for example makes sense and it makes sense because he, he dives into both not only like the emotional aspect of things but also like the physiological so it's like a whole nature and nurture nurturing he brings up a lot it makes sense too even communicating somebody with body language mm-hmm. if you see somebody being very fidgety or nervous uh females are a lot better at picking up nonverbal cues from youth and you eventually get better and even is, evens out i mm-hmm. we could argue that one and you can tell if somebody's not giving you great eye contact or uh, they're not very good with their words. Even interviewing uh, some virtual assistants, you could kind of pick up on things that make you question things. So you are right how all these things come into come into play as far as hierarchy. 100%. And it's cool because these 12 rules for life, they're like 12 things that you could do. So for this first one, you know, stand up straight, you know, hold your head up high. Don't don't be looking down because in back in the day, looking down was like a sign of fear. So people were, were intrinsically... Uh, programmed already to to recognize that that if someone's has slouched shoulders and they're walking with their head down it's almost like they're they're defeated and somebody else is picking up on that but also your body's also picking up on that um eye contact is a really big thing too if you give a lot of eye contact that's more beneficial it's not only the person that you're talking to but also yourself because it's just one of those things that's 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 kind of shows you that you're not scared you could say confidence mm. Uh, the second one was treat yourself like you are so, sorry treat yourself like you are someone you are responsible for helping so he brings up the point that this is kind of similar to a man i always say that you're good at giving advice but never good at taking it so look at how well people care for their pets their dogs their their, their cats they feed them healthy food they take them for walks but then when you look at the the, the person you know, they don't look like they're in the best of health. So why is it that that you're able to take care of a dog this well, give them the right food, take them for walks, have them be healthy, and have a nice long life, but then you can't do it for yourself. So that brings up the point where you gotta you gotta change. You gotta actually take care of yourself and realize that hey, part of life is is me taking care of myself. So that, that was like the main factor for that point. Especially mm. like n- nurses out there, we always come second and neglect that part. Hundred mm. uh, percent. Number three is make friends with people who want the best for you that goes into the point where if you surround yourself with good with good people you're going to be that be that good person same way you should try to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you because then you're able to kind of raise your raise your playing field uh, and be be amongst them as well you're going to learn from them you're going to all learn together so if you want to be somebody then surround yourself with people that that you want to be you could say and that's, that's so true. Like, look at your friends group. If you're, if all your friends are doing drugs and partying, well, you're probably doing drugs and partying too. If your friends don't exercise any junk food, they you probably don't exercise any junk food. So surround yourself with people that actually care about you, and that's going to reflect back on you. It's definitely hard to do, even in this household, when people are like, "We're getting Mexican or burrito." Maybe you're not trying to get a burrito today. Mm. That peer pressure of both of, both of the guys going out grabbing food just kind of makes you want to submit and go get a burrito. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but. And no comments on that one, man. No complaints. We don't eat, don't eat a lot, but when we when we eat out, we go we go we go heavy. Uh, point number five is do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. So people have to realize that internally uh, we're programmed. We always want to, if somebody upsets us, we kind of always, we want to upset them almost. So he brings up up, up the point where well, children they're constant learners and. The fact that we're programmed always to one up each other, sometimes we do that to our own, own kids, and we do that to our friends and, and all that. And it just, it's it's okay, it's okay, I guess, to kind of do that. But realize you're you're doing it and try to catch yourself almost, because as as a kid, they're always learning. You shouldn't blame them for anything, but but it doesn't mean that that you shouldn't be stern with them because a child has to learn their boundary. A child's gonna keep pushing those boundaries until you lay down lay down the law and tell them what the boundaries are because it doesn't know where the, the kid does not know where the boundaries are and his whole life is trying to figure out those boundaries so it's like trying to find a a nice balance between between um enough punishment and too much punishment you could say it's all it's all good stuff you should read the book bro i feel better or not but you should some read of these it. days I'll yeah more time in my life um number six is set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world same thing. Uh, I got into a little argument with a redditor back, like back couple of uh, weeks ago. Uh, I'm not gonna get into detail why because 
It, it, it doesn't really matter what keyboard it's, warrior it is. life. Yeah, it doesn't matter, matter what it is. But basically, um, one of the things that, that I said is is trying to basically, why don't we stop fast food restaurants in America and try to focus on making America better? And he's like, oh, that's so American of you. Why, why would you just think of America, not the rest of the world? And then so I brought up the point where it's just like, hey, if I can't fix my own country, how am I gonna fuck? How am I gonna fix another country that I don't live in? So it's like, if if you don't clean your shit up, how can you give advice to somebody that that has their shit dirty too? It's like you gotta fix yourself and realize that hey, this worked. Then you could give some advice. You have to first change your life before trying to change someone else's. Because if if you're, for example, doing drugs and not a good good part of your life, how are you gonna help somebody else to get out, get out of the area? You have to first help yourself to then eventually be able to help somebody else. Really, really, really crazy good point. point. He, yeah, he, he brings up uh, cleaning a room because once you have a clean room, uh, it's almost like you have a clean mind because a lot of times when you go out to someone's house and, you know, they're, maybe this is a Polish thing, but when your house is, is a mess, Polish people pick on it, pick up on it. Like, you know, even though, if you, even though you don't want to, it's like sub, subliminally messy. It's ingrained messy. in her brain. It's ingrained, yeah. And, and you kind of look at, like, if you're at, like, a girl's house where I slept over or whatever and she has a, a messy room and she kind of a messy, messy personality, that kind of shows, like, it, it's it's correlated. It's, it's um... It's are you getting shows are you. you getting in her car and mm-hmm. there's a bunch of stuff on the seat on the floor. Oh sorry, sorry, I just got busy from work. Blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, mm-hmm. for sure, girl. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent, right? And they're all they're all like, you know How's your room though? <laughs> right, right. You know, so it, it just shows you how the stuff you are internally almost projects to your external environment. Uh number seven is pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient. Uh or ex expedient. I don't even know how you say that word. But pursue what is meaningful. So basically, in this chapter, he summarized um, the benefit of delaying gratification. So we all we all like things to be easy for, for us to do. But if you actually want to become somebody and actually want to do something with your life, nothing comes in a, sh- in a short term ever. You have to delay, delay that gratification. It means you have to put in the time now to reap the rewards later. And that's just that just takes time. And it is what it is. And that's why he brings up suffering a lot is because everything is suffering. If you want to get that nursing degree, you probably got to suffer two years of prerequisites and then two years of nursing school. Four years of suffering is going to get you a nursing degree. But it's better to do that four years of suffering through school than four years of working at McDonald's, right? 100%. Anybody can agree. Both are stressful. Both are suffering. But one has a higher suffering than the other because you get a lot better delay of gratification in the nursing school one versus McDonald's and then getting a manager role. But then either way, you'd still probably make more money as a nurse compared to a McDonald's manager. Uh, number eight is tell the truth or at least don't lie. And he brings up a good point that about Nazi Germany because Nazi Germany was built on small lies. It's not just Hitler didn't wake up one day and said, hey, we're going to solve Germany's problems by getting rid of the Jewish people. That's not how it happened. It started with these small lies. Hey, we're going to we're gonna do this and then we're going to do that. And it and it made into this, this, this big giant world war. And it's, it didn't all just start out of just one thing. That's kind of um, why... It's difficult to teach the, the the full history of World War Two and even World War One um, in in school because it's not because in a textbook you seem like it's just a, a small time frame and only took like a little spark but it it wasn't a spark that, that sparked World War Two it was slow lies gradual changing people's minds gradual um, compliance over these new regulations new things and that's why people are scared of the stuff that's going going on now because. All of a sudden, you're required to do these certain things. Uh, media is feeding you this one agenda. Government keeps passing these laws where you have to abide by it. And people, and, and you understand that like, people started to relate this to Nazi Germany. It's it's nothing like Nazi Germany right right now. But we got realized that before Nazi Germany was Nazi Germany, there was these small little little things that that would, which would change over time that make people, people comply. That eventually led to this crazy as Holocaust that we had. Even there was a quote by a Jewish person that said. We didn't know what was coming or we didn't realize what these events correlated to till we started walking around with these stars on their coats. Mm-hmm. So every single time they were in public, they had to wear a star for the type of Jew that you were in each country. So Croatia, Poland, wherever the Jews were, they had a different star to segregate them based on what uh, country they're coming from. Yeah. And that's when they're like, whoa, this is not normal. And it was a little bit too late mm-hmm. at that point. Yep, you just do a little bit at a time each time, and people start to get okay, 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 okay. And then by the time you realize, like, oh shit, what's going on? You've already to 99 things. Now the 100th thing came, and now 
Now you're uh, and that's kind of what's happening in this country, not to digress, but there's increments of things that are happening to take away your freedom. And then there's a resistance in the people. And they're like, okay, let's take a couple of steps back. We take a step back and then we take two steps forward. Mm. And we're resistance again. Okay, let's lay back a little bit, push again. Mm. And we think that we ha are, are having victories, but really we're just still being pushed towards the same trap. Mm. 100%. I, let's Absolutely. not talk about this we yeah. can go off another tangent here and man. it's like people got to realize that once you get a freedom taken away no one gives that back to you it's it's not given give it back to you that's why the whole gun policy thing is it's like oh why can't we, we have this kind of gun why can't we have that kind of gun why because once you get take, taken away it's not gonna it's not gonna change it's not gonna be, be given back to you it doesn't matter and it's gonna they're gonna keep taking and taking and taking because it's just how how human nature works because if you're a government official and you have authority there's something in us that that we want to control something, something else. Especially if you're in government, if you're like a, a manager. That's why you have sometimes even nurse managers. They go it's like this power hungry, hung hungry thing, and you don't understand why. But when you're in in that role, you're blind to it. You think you you know more than everybody else, and you think and you think what you know is right. And it's called ignorance, and sometimes it gets the best of us. Ignorance is a blitz. Yeah. Uh, number nine is assume that the person you're listening to might know something you don't. So it's interesting because he highlights that memory it's not it's, it isn't a tool for the past. It's uh, something that's used for the future. For example, memory doesn't teach you that the stove is hot. It teaches you that that, that you got burned by touching the, touching the stove. So it prevents you from repeating the past. That's what memory is there for, so you don't screw up again. That's like that's what people fail to realize is that memory prevents you from doing the same thing over and over and over again. Otherwise you'd be psychotic. So let that let that being learning lesson learning lesson to you. Another one is, is um, we're going to, to number nine again, is next time you listen, don't try to judge the person that's, that you're listening to and don't try to already evaluate them. Don't try to assume that they're trying to prove a point. Just listen to what they have to say and that's going to go a long way because we're, we're forever learners and somebody, somebody might know, know more than you, which is okay, but somebody might have a different opinion. But that's okay too because they're raised differently. They grew up differently. They have different experiences and that's completely okay. A lot, of, a lot of things that we talk about that we go through life is very subjective. Not a lot of things are ob objective. Yeah. Real listening is a skill that you have to cultivate because mm. a lot of us just project judgment from our, from our own stories that we tell. Mm. Uh, number 10 is be precise in your speech. So he relates this to nobody knows what you want unless you tell them. We can't read each other's minds. You have to be able to articulate the point you're trying to make and your, and your needs because no one can make those needs needs met if you don't start speaking up about it and i was actually reading something with like the whole child psychology and trauma etc that's like a big thing now is um because our needs weren't met when we we're younger we kind of carry that into adulthood and we think that it's not okay to speak up to let your needs know mm. like let your needs known because no one is going to know right and we think we trust that a lot as well and it's, and it's, it's true because a lot of people get into conflict with each other and it's like hey like you know if like you see your friends arguing or something or you're you have a friend that's like a girl or, or a guy and they're like having trouble in a, in a relationship you're just like like what's going on like how are you guys arguing and it's like oh because he did this and and i felt like this well did you tell him and it's like no well it's like no she had the same problems repeating itself because nobody knows what the hell the other person wants or needs and it's crazy how that keeps happening. Yeah, I feel like I was a little bit passive aggressive in the past, and that's a big lesson I've learned in my life. Yeah, the thing is that everybody is, and you yeah. just, just gotta learn to accept it. It's just it's growing pains. Like, how are you gonna learn not to be passive aggressive? You don't first understand that you are passive aggressive, right? You, you have to go through those bef before you you walk, you crawl. But it, you, before you start walking from crawling, you're probably gonna bust your shit a few times. Yep, it just is what it is. Just, why am I suffering? Why am I suffering? Mm. Oh, that's right. Yep, yep. It's all right. Well, now you learned. Uh, number 11 is do not bother children when they are skateboarding. So when I first read this, it was kind of funny. I was trying to figure out like w w what it meant. But it basically means that we're the humans are are naturally natural risk takers because we, under, because we understand that without risk, there is no reward. And the best reward is usually comes with, with highest risk. Uh, that's why we like to watch athletic sports because it's, it's risky business. Uh, like watching football or UFC or any kind of serious dangerous sports like that. We like watching it because that's a high risk, but winning a, a winning in a sport is a really really big reward. Not just financially, but also like motivationally and mentally and, and emotionally. 
Is that's all that really means. Because when I first read it, I was like, what, is it, what does it mean? Uh, number 12 is pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. Uh, that just basically means that, like, it's okay to, like, just step out of your, your life for a little bit. Just so you can reflect or just to kind of take, like, a breath of, like, relaxation. Like, it, it's okay to just, like, drop whatever you're doing and do something else for, like, for a little bit. And that's like, I feel like a lot of people need that, especially nowadays, especially during this pandemic where everyone's super stressed, just working nonstop, grinding, grinding, grinding. It's been, you know, these mask mandates. I can't go to this place because of this. What about like this person, COVID, now that we're healthcare workers, like, you know, I work in this pandemic, super job is super stressful. So it's okay for us to just step back and just not focus on that shit. Just step away from it and let it be because you're going to come back to it eventually. So just take this 15 seconds to like pet the cat. Very good point. And sometimes even with like the the work ethic and the whole hustle cultures, like we think that we all have to be working nonstop, grinding, getting it. Like you need that time to do nothing. Mm. Be a couch potato in the couch. Like take, you need that. Those, um, the indica. Yeah. You need those, uh, what is it called? The other duality of it, basically. I'm, I'm lacking the word there. Yeah, and it's okay. Like, it's okay. I know because especially Western culture, because in Europe, they're more they're more prone to taking breaks. They're okay with having a little bit of a more relaxed, laid-back kind of thing. That's why it's the San Diego vibe because everyone's here kind of chill. Kicking it. Yeah, but, like, Western culture, it's all fast-paced. Like, if you're not working, well, guess what? If you take one minute off, well, guess what? That's one minute. Somebody else is going to take advantage of that minute and it will work harder on you. It's not like that, man. 100%. So the book that I've enjoyed in this past year that I've grown to love and taught me a lot is uh, called Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And the summary of it is just his collection of 12 books that were written by this Roman emperor that uh, was around three, 400 uh, AD. And he kind of introduced me to the Stoic philosophy, the concept of logic, self-discipline. And he basically says, for the most part, the world is operating in good. And it's operating good for you. You just have to see those things and all that. And he was using the word universe already back then, which was interesting because he was, I don't know if he was religious or not, religious or not. Uh, but he called this, these collection of books, writings uh, to himself. So book one, he kind of talks about who he uh, wants to thank, who he ha- kind of had debt to, his father who showed him how to be hum- uh, humble, his mother how he showed him how to be non-materialistic, and his other teachers that showed him work ethic. So this was a, a chance for him to reflect back in life and he, uh, showing gratitude. The second part of the book, and these are the, the books, it's like an, almost like an autobiography, and he was writing it on different tours, uh, military tours and all that uh, throughout his life. Uh, the second one, he says that each day we'll meet some terrible people, and, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And he also says that that death is nothing to fear. It can't hurt us. But what's important about us, what are, what's important is our minds. We shouldn't let them be slaves to the selfish passions and to argue, to be anxious, and to be worrying about the present or just to worry about the present and not to be afraid of the future because mm. we can't guarantee anything. But what, what we can't guarantee any pleasures of the future, but what we can do is if we can control our mind, we could have freedom in the present moment. And that's the whole stoic philosophy there. Yeah, it's true because if you think about it, you're not responsible for your thoughts. You're responsible for your actions. Because some of the, the thoughts you get sometimes, I guarantee you're just like, how the hell do I think of that? Like, am I, am I just kind of a weirdo? But it's really not. It's just like, it's just, just, your, just your mind working. And you got to understand that it's okay to have random thoughts. You know, might not be the best thoughts, might not be the worst thoughts, but they're random, right? So you got you to understand that they're going to be there. But you got to also understand that you can control the thoughts that you want to take control of. Yes. And it's actually pretty cool. He wrote this uh, while like going to war, right? Yeah, it's almost like, I don't know if it's always in war, but eventually he died. Uh, I'm going to go later in the book, but he eventually died trying to finish this. And then what happened is uh, th- these books and writings were just in a book. I don't know what a library. And then a German uh printer whoever noticed these readings of philosophy is like wow this has to be out mm. so he's the one that ended up publish publishing his books and uh became to what it was because yeah, it was yeah. just a journal technically yeah i mean if i was going to war i'd probably write a book too it's dope 
Please take some notes. So uh, book number three tells us a little bit about how to be mindful to notice things in life, like the cracks in a loaf of bread or how the texture of the figs and olive looks. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of teaching you how to be more present. And he says to talk about things they would not be ashamed of if they were found out. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like talk to people uh, with respect, essentially. And there's nothing more valuable than pursuing truth, justice, uh, temperance and things like that. So he was more um, Stoics are very about virtue and uh, to what's it called to go after that. Mm. Uh, book number four, he tells us how to always find solitude in our minds. And this was like a chapter about the universe and how to cultivate peace and happiness uh, as far as how to view others because we don't have control over them. So this book kind of talks about how uh, preventing that judgment mm -hmm. because you can't control their people. So if you want somebody to behave a certain way, it's always going to lead you to unhappiness hmm. because you can't control that other aspect of the human. Right. But you can control how you react to the situation. Right? Yes. The response. Book number five, uh, he basically says each day you should wake up and do good work. Uh, as humans, it's our nature to act and contribute to society without expecting something back. Hmm. So if you do a good deed, you shouldn't expect anything ba back. Just understand just to be satisfied with it, live life in virtue, and eventually things are going to come in full circle back to you. And it's going to reward you because at the end of the day, for the most part, the world is a good place. Mm -hmm. So virtue has its own reward. It's like, what did he mention? He said, um, be satisfied with being like vines that bear good fruit. Mm -hmm. Book number six, so um, Marcus Aurelius disvows revenge and saying it's not our duty to injure people and not have like an eye for an eye. So you shouldn't, you should always act righteous, righteous no matter what the situation is. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, going back to the Stoic philosophy, you could always control the good things and you can control your mind and not to be reactive to that person no matter what they did. Right. Uh, book number seven, he very he advocates um, patience and tolerance. So he says that nature works like wax. It's continuously transforming, so be patient. And then he kind of reflects back to evil people that you should uh, try your patience and be tolerant of them and back to the whole uh, happiness and controlling your stimulus and response to people. And you can't control what they um, ultimately do. Yeah, because eventually you leave. Like, we've all had that, that person that's just tried to annoy us and they tried real hard and we just ignored it and without even without even reacting they they stopped doing it so it yeah. makes sense patience and, is key and ultimately like if that person is bothering you just don't feed them your energy because that's what they want from you mm -hmm. essentially is attention just laugh it off and uh, that's the best you can do like someone is so serious trying to come after you and all you do is just kind of think it's a joke mm -hmm. they'll get upset but what happens is you're not attaching and you're not leaking your energy onto that person. Yeah. Harder said than done, but it definitely works. It's harder to do it in the moment. Uh, but what happens is in these lessons is you might not notice it in the lesson in the present moment. You might re realize it like 30 minutes later, an hour later. Uh, but then you could start realizing these lessons in your life. Mm -hmm. And then once again, the situation rises, you could get better, better at it. And eventually, bam, you could catch yourself in a moment and not react to that negative person, whatever the case might be. Um, Book number eight, he argues how humanity is, we should never be disconnected from humanity. That's like cutting off one of the limbs. We also should be living uh, connected uh, amongst people and even nature. No matter what you encounter, back to controlling your mind because it's stoic philosophy. And it's so true because if you look at like C-19 and everything happening nowadays, everybody's so disconnected. They're acting like NPCs in society. Non-personal... In video games, is basically the the computer character. Like it's like you're trying to shoot the person. They're not real. They're they're just a fictional <laughs> character in the game. I don't Which explain I it. Them, huh? And like with COVID and everything, non-player character. Yeah, non-player character. And with like COVID, everybody's like almost like a zombie. There's no interactions. You're not reading facial expressions. Just like people are minding their own business. Mm -hmm. We're literally disconnected from each other, uh, which is sad. Um, book 9, 10, 11, he argues how we should always be honest and calm back to the whole virtuous thing of living life with integrity, um, and using, um, humor to disarm bad people, essentially kill them with kindness, uh, which was, um, his philosophy. Yeah. Cause they're trying to annoy you. So like, what's the 
opposite of, of anger. It's happiness. So yes. just, you know, give them a little taste. Of, I don't want to say taste of their own medicine because it's not their own medicine. Yeah. That's more like an eye for an eye, right? Exactly. Something we want to not go for. Mm-hmm. Uh, book number 12 was very profound as well. It's really spoke to me because he says that we love ourselves at our best, but often we value the opinion of others for, over our own. So we love ourselves so much. We're so important. Yet one person says something and we just take it to heart and whatever we are, I, I feel like we don't have character and it's so easy just to like pop your bubble almost. Mm-hmm. Like we just need to get more. I'm, I'm lacking the word like more. more. Harder, yeah, stay hard. We, we need a better foundation. Yeah, we don't know our own we're, character, and we just like we're a uh, like a not a haystack. We're a house of cards. Yeah, we're too reliant on on how people view us more than how we view ourselves, and especially now with the age of social media, that's exactly what it is, and it's even even tougher, especially for all you females out there, like these Instagram standards. Like, trust me, like no dude buys these fake Instagram standards. It's just. Women think that that they do. Women think that they have to be this perfect, you know, ten out of, out of ten. But trust me, you don't. Like being an eight is, is perfect. Just, just do your thing, you know. And it's like it's like right now. Like I'm, I'm. We're probably. I'm not probably not even doing anybody a favor. Like labeling. Oh, like this girl's eight out of, eight out of ten. Like it's, it's you can't put put beauty and personality on on, on numbers because it's all it's all different. So it's it, yeah. It's it's unfortunate what society has become and just. Be true, be true to yourself. You don't have to value yourself on other people's opinions because, like Matt said, with all these these books, you you, you can see that majority of people around you they don't want the best for you. That's why uh, Marcus Aurelius keeps stating that to to be patient, to know yourself, stay calm, kill with kindness, all this stoic stuff. Because you have a lot of enemies enemies in this world. You have more enemies than, than friends, and when you think about it. But yet the world is still a really, really good place. It's just the way some people are and you, you just can't do anything about it. So so if you can't do anything about it, then just try to worry about it. But also be true to yourself. That's the only way that you could take advantage of the life that we have. Because Enjoy your response. Cause, yeah, because this life on this, this earth, we're not sure what's going to happen when we, when we die. This might be our only chance at, at living like this. And you don't want to move on to the next world with, with regret saying that oh, I wish I would have just pursued the things that I, that I love wish I would have pursued the person that, that, I, that I wanted to be with because this might be the last time that, that you could do this kind of thing so just stay true to yourself and don't base yourself off someone's opinions and, and judgment 100% and towards the end of the book he says that remember that destiny of the greatest and the worst human beings is the same they all turn to ashes mm-hmm. so why take their opinions to heart when we all have the same trajectory which is which is death. Yes, yeah, so we all we all bleed the same blood. Yes, we do. And one of the last things he said, which was in his tent, in modern day uh, Austria, they don't know if he died from warfare, from a wound or cancer, but that's what they are um, speculating. Alzheimer's, you never know. Yeah, he says that life is a warfare and a stranger's sojourn, and after fame, oblivion. And sojourn means a temporary stay. Hmm. So it's we're here. Just like uh, Jordan Peters says, we're here for suffering. We're here to learn, to experience, and to go through this. And just remember that it's a temporary stay. Just laugh at the enemies. Have a good time. Mm-hmm. Live your life. Don't take things to heart because life is too short to care about those things and focusing on negative things. Right. I feel like there's a lot of similarities between these two books. They are. And it's funny because they both have 12, they have 12. Yeah. 12 uh, books or chapters mm-hmm. or lessons. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because, I mean... These are some of the most brilliant minds, you know, that have ever lived. And they all, a lot of times they all come to the same conclusion. And it's like the, it gets repeated over and over and passed on and passed on. But yeah, we, we still learn. And a lot of times these people learn these things and write these things before their death because they've experienced life and, and they know what their experience is. And now they try to pass it on to somebody else. And yeah, people still make, make the same mistakes and still to learn from it. It's just, we're, we're forever, you know, we're f- forever learning. And no one's going to be born a scientist, born a, a genius. Even though there's some gifted kids out there, they, they still don't know everything. It's just life's, life's your own journey. And the beauty of it is that, that you control more than you think you control. And yeah, we kind of, you could say, take it for granted and let other people's opinions hurt us more than, than our own. You could we say. give power to the wrong things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right. Hope you guys are empowered from this episode. 
A lot of life lessons there. If you guys want to repeat that one and learn from it. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed these books in the library month. See you next time. Have a good one, y'all. Surprise no candle bag. Yeah, right? One hour. Back to the standard, bro.